Hello everyone and welcome to the third of five webinars in our Further Learning in Musculoskeletal Health webinar series. My name is Jen Nolan and Arthritis and Osteoporosis Victoria is pleased to be presenting this series for Victorian primary and community health staff on behalf of the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services. Today's webinar is titled Acute and Persistent Back Pain, Translating Current Evidence into Clinical Practice. The project we are undertaking for the department will also involve the development of an online learning and development resource for health professionals where the webinar recordings and other practice tools and resources will be available soon on our website. Before introducing our presenter, however, I just have a couple of housekeeping issues to run through. Firstly, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please refer to the message box on your screen you can type a message at any time that will be read by the conference organiser at Redback Conferencing. If you are listening via the phone, you will notice a small time delay between the audio and the screen. This is normal, so don't be concerned. Also, whilst our presenter will answer questions after the completion of his presentation, you can actually type questions for him at any time. Can I suggest that you don't leave your questions to the last minute, as we will aim to finish no later than 1.30pm Australian Eastern Summer Time. I would also be very grateful if all participants could take a moment at the end of the webinar to complete the exit survey. It will only take you approximately 30 seconds to complete. Our presenter for today is Dr Tim Mitchell. Tim is a specialist musculoskeletal physiotherapist and works in clinical practice and at Curtin University as a senior lecturer and researcher in the School of Physiotherapy and Exercise Science. He has completed a PhD in the area of low back pain and has a special interest in the management of complex and chronic injuries and pain disorders. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Tim. Thanks very much, Tim. Thanks, Jen, and thanks to everyone for um, listening to this presentation today. The, the focus, as is listed there, is on acute and persistent back pain, but really in the primary care setting. So we're looking at current evidence and how we can translate that into what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis in our with our patients or clients presenting with back pain. So what we'll be looking at, at doing, just sorry my disclosures, um, senior lecturer at Curtin University as mentioned, and also work in private clinic um, managing acute and chronic complex musculoskeletal pain presentations with a large proportion of that being low back pain. So we'll go through the obvious information about low back pain, but I also want to give you a little bit of a perspective on some other factors or information around low back pain that can be quite relevant in the clinic and new directions of where things are heading in the area of, of back pain knowledge and management. So simple definitions first, if we talk about low back pain, we're really talking about pain in that region between T12 and the gluteal folds, as you can see on the picture there. Now in terms of definitions, just a little bit of important information to be aware of. Back pain can be defined in research settings, which is this information here. So looking at pain intensity in terms of interference with normal activities and also functional status. So that's important when we're comparing across research with low back pain. Um, but from a patient's perspective in the clinic, it's really about the impact of their pain on their, their function and daily life. And that's important given over 80% of us experience low back pain at some time in our life. It's actually the second most common reason people will attend to the GP. So this is some slightly older data from America, but just to align us about what's happening in the management of back pain, and I'll bring that to current information um, briefly. So this is evidence from the Journal of the American Board of Family Medicine. So if we look from 1994 to 2004, imaging for low back pain in terms of MRI has risen. The use of opioids for managing back pain problems has risen, similar with epidural steroids and also lumbar fusion rates for degenerative spinal conditions. So despite our world of, of modern technology over this time frame from mid-90s to mid-2000s, the actual percentage of disability in people working with musculoskeletal conditions has actually risen. And this is really an interesting concept when you look at management of other, other disorders such as circulatory conditions or respiratory conditions, sort of medical management and effect in terms of disability of those is actually on the improve. Now, unfortunately this doesn't seem to be changing. 
in this global burden of disease data, you'll see here for both developing countries and developed countries, low back pain is listed as number one in terms of the causes of years lived with disability. So effectively a measure of the impact of, of low back pain in people's lives. So on a more local level, this information from Arthritis Victoria um, has informed us that musculoskeletal conditions affect a lot of people and in fact more than any, any other national health priority area. And it's not just older people. So when we look at the working population, 58% of those people are affected by musculoskeletal conditions and that's almost 27% of the, the population in Australia. Now also importantly, future projections, so by 2032 these conditions will affect 30% of the population, so a 3% increase in that time frame and specifically back problems are predicted still to continue to grow by a further 31%. And we look at that in terms of the prevalence of back problems. Total host cost of health condition in 2012, over half of that could be attributed to low back, to back pain rather. So there's clearly significant financial impact and also work impact on low back pain. When we look at definitions um, well accepted internationally in terms of the burden of disease of musculoskeletal disorders, there's obviously the health burden, so the costs that we have in managing a condition economic burden, usually measured in terms of productivity factors, so absenteeism, which is time off work, but also importantly presenteeism, so while people are still working with some sort of health condition, it does impact on their work productivity, and that's thought to be more expensive than the costs in terms of absenteeism. And particularly from a personal perspective, the personal burden in terms of on the individual, but also significant others, so that can be other family members, co-workers or other, other members in the community that are impacted by people's pain. And I certainly know if, from my experience but if you have other people that you know that are close to you experiencing pain, it impacts across all facets of our lives. Now specifically for back pain, and this is broadly recognised across musculoskeletal conditions, when someone's presenting in the clinic, particularly in the acute situation, we're looking at a diagnosis for that patient, so a diagnostic triage. And the triage is really specific, non-specific or red flags. So in terms of, if we look at the red flags concept, so these are conditions that need immediate medical care and examples as you can see are discitis, spinal tumour, quarter equinus syndrome or potentially an acute fracture. In terms of specific diagnoses, the number of these in terms of their relevance to management of back pain is actually relatively low. So typical examples would be radiculopathy and also stress fracture and of course other musculoskeletal conditions where there's a clear disorder involved such as rheumatoid arthritis which is then resulting in back pain could also be relevant. Now there's a number of guidelines around the care of back pain and in the resources that have been added to this uh, webinar you'll see this article by Ma et al 2011 from the Australian prescriber and it's really a good current review of the guidelines around management of low back pain, particularly in the acute setting and I'll just go through the information based around that now. So obviously as mentioned if we're talking about triaging patients with back pain, really what we're looking at our first questions are obviously are they presenting with back pain, how's their general health and do they have any red flags or not. Okay. So if we consider that there's signs of serious disease then that process of imaging blood tests and on referral becomes important. But if you're working in primary care this is ultimately less than 1% of the, the flow of patients that you would end up seeing. Okay. Information here which you can use for your reference or review is listed from that paper around red flags, so talking about warnings for serious conditions of how they might present, so common ones being cancer, vertebral infection, quarter equinus syndrome and also a vertebral fracture. So they're important things that we might need to look out with with quick screening questions. But keep in mind just one of these signs such as fever alone for example or unexplained weight loss, those are individual red flags whereas importantly a cluster of red flags is a much better indicator of pathology. 
and a useful clinical resource is the Pain Health website, which you'll see the link for there. There's a medical self-check that has been reviewed by a range of different health professionals that is deemed appropriate that patients could use, but even um, practitioners could use in terms of patients doing a quick medical screen that gives us good information about are there a number of flags coming up which could help inform us at the start of our assessment of a patient presenting with acute back pain. So assuming we've excluded red flags and this patient has acute non-specific low back pain, first line of care is basically advice, simple analgesics and review in one to two weeks. Okay. If these patients aren't responding, the second line care is potentially to consider stronger analgesics and physical therapies. Now if we look across at the second option, is if they have no red flags but they have an associated radiculopathy, so more of a specific disorder that's acute. If you look at the first line care, the first line care is exactly the same as for non-specific back pain. So advice, simple analgesics and review in one to two weeks. And again, there's options there listed for the second line care, but you'll also note that surgical opinion is listed in that one. So if we look at that in a bit more detail, the simple analgesics are recommended at the moment is actually paracetamol, so one gram four times a day. In terms of the advice component, this is the information that's been reasonably well researched. So basically reassuring the patient that there's no major damage going on in their spine, being careful to avoid labels such as injury, such as you've got a disc problem, you've got a facet joint problem for example. So more simple language such as you've got a, a sprain in your back similar to something like an ankle sprain for example. So clear simple language that the patient can relate to that reduces labels and potential alarm. Informing them about positive prognosis associated with back pain that a lot of it does recover in a short period and you'll see down the bottom there in a, a big study using these acute management guidelines published in Lancet, 50% of patients with acute back pain were pain free after two weeks with following these guidelines. So that can be really useful information to provide to your patient. Staying active is really important. Simple treatments are helpful, so things like using heat, gentle mobility for example, Avoid the term listen to your pain, so not telling your patient oh, if it's really bad don't do anything, be guided by your pain. Actually information around take the analgesics as prescribed, stay active and use those simple treatments such as heat and gentle movement is a more important and helpful approach. And encouraging them, look if you do these right things and take management of this problem or control of this problem yourself, that's also associated with faster improvement from your acute episode of back pain. You'll note the second line care in terms of increased analgesia, so potentially considering the use of anti-inflammatory medication, potentially codeine for stronger pain. There is some recommendations around spinal manipulative therapy, but we'll look at a little bit more in terms of the information based on that. Hot packs, heat can also be helpful, but most importantly, even in that second line care, so review after one to two weeks, avoiding bed rest is a very important message and not ordering imaging as well. And I'll cover a little bit of current information around imaging shortly. So if we look at those acute management guidelines, here's some interesting research that's been done. So even with prescribing patients paracetamol, 82% of those patients were underdosing on the prescribed paracetamol. And having appropriate pain cover that allows the patient to stay active and mobile is important a part of that healing process. So lack of adherence to the guidelines around paracetamol is an important issue. From the healthcare practitioner perspective, so looking at people getting advice in primary care, only 21% of patients necessarily <laughs> receive that appropriate advice in this study. Only 18% received or were recommended to take paracetamol. 37% of patients um, were prescribed NSAIDs and 20% of patients were prescribed opioid medication. So the question is why? So one of these things is the guidelines are there, they've been shown to be fairly effective for acute back pain but clearly they're not being followed very consistently. And one of the big issues here is around beliefs about pain. 
and this applies to both patients but also healthcare practitioners. So those beliefs might be around the meaning of what's happening in the spine. So you can see this is a typical spinal model with a great big red disc bulge there and even the imagery of someone presenting with pain. If we show them a model with a bright red disc bulge on there, that can really impact on their levels of, or, of alarm or concern because we can show a nerve coming out and that can be squashed. So we can create images that are quite powerful and some of those powerful images can be negative or unhelpful. And also beliefs, for example, around lifting. We won't go into this in detail today, but the evidence behind how you lift and the relationship to low back pain is actually very poor. However, in the community setting and also in healthcare setting, you see these types of posters everywhere telling people how they should or shouldn't be lifting. So there's a range of factors beyond how we lift that's important, but the strongly held belief tends to persist with information that patients, to the, that patients are given. So there's a number of studies that look at negative beliefs about back pain. And basically, if people have a negative belief about the pain and they're fearful of moving when they're presenting with pain, that alone is predictive of their levels of disability. So the information we provide or the information that patients come in with when they're attending um, for advice or management of their back pain, understanding what the patient's beliefs are around that are really important and can be predictive of their levels of disability. Biomedical orientation, so of the healthcare practitioner, leads to greater advice to limit work and reduce physical activity. So this is a really important issue. If the healthcare practitioner believes strongly in trying to find a label such as you've got a disc problem, you've got a facet joint problem, where we know that information is helpful, it actually also leads to more unhelpful advice, so not following the recommended guidelines for educating patients regarding the management of their back pain. So basically if our beliefs are negative, that influences how the way, the way we might manage our patients. So having our beliefs aligned with current knowledge, which we're helping to provide today, is really important in having a more positive effect or outcome with our patients. The good news is brief practitioner education can positively influence beliefs and also practice management behaviours. This has been shown in a number of studies, for example, the first one by Slater et al looking at GP education in a rural setting. Um, I've recently been involved in a study with educating um, claims managers in the workers' compensation sector and we've also been able to change their practice behaviours by simple education around informing knowledge and beliefs around back pain. So coming back to imaging for back pain, these are guidelines from WA Health which you can access via this link here about back pain and levels of evidence. So that, as we've mentioned before, the prevalence of serious pathology in patients presenting for primary care is very rare, so we need to be aware of the flags, but the, the prevalence of that is low. And routine imaging without indications for serious pathology doesn't affect the management or improve the outcomes. And obviously there's radiation risks depending on the type of imaging and also increased cost. So in the primary care setting, we really need to be thinking twice about the need for undertaking imaging. These are guidelines from um, the US around the, the management of back pain in terms of radiology. They reviewed um, a number of studies. So of the six studies which compared routine radiology versus not, the patients didn't do any different, so they didn't get any better by having radiology. And also some of those that didn't get radiology actually had improved outcomes. So evidence there that early radiology for patients may have a negative impact on their outcome. Interesting questions here which I think are, are worth considering. Why are so many radiological tests undertaken for people with back pain? Patient expectation is often a big one and practitioners will often say it's easier to order the test than it is to explain why the test is not needed. But that alone arguably isn't a good excuse, particularly if ordering that test may have negative impacts on beliefs and potentially outcome for the patient. And obviously some implications about not ordering testing for fear of perhaps not picking up serious underlying pathology. So what should be done? Really important, we need to explain to the patient why there's no need for radiology even though their backs hurt. So again, that simple language around you've, equivalent, you've got the equivalent of an ankle sprain in your back. So that acute sprain, you would know with your ankle if you'd sprained it, you'd take your weight off it for a little bit. So keep moving it but not avoid, sorry, but not overload it all the time. 
and we'd expect that to recover and calm down over the space of a few days and we can gradually build things up and get you moving normally on your ankle. Same concept with your back. So explaining the course of back pain, practical advice around what we've listed earlier and also other treatment options for patients. So just another study just to clarify, particularly in older adults but when we talk about older I think as we all age our definition of older changes but degenerative changes in the lumbar spine are commonly found from the age of 30 onwards particularly in older adults it's there in a the vast majority of patients so over 90 percent does demonstrate some sort of degeneration. Now this study showed that presence of severe disc pathology was associated with a twofold greater odds of having chronic back pain so if your disc pathology is very severe compared to not, you're twice as more likely to have back pain. But how severe that degeneration is doesn't actually correlate with how severe your pain is. And I've worked in tertiary settings of spinal surgical clinics, seeing patients referred to that clinic with terrible looking spines on their scans and the GP's been very concerned and referred them for a tertiary opinion but the level of symptoms for a number of these patients is amazingly low. So unless the radiology correlates with their clinical presentation, we have to be very careful of putting too much weight on the radiology itself. Okay, just to come on now, so we've talked a bit there about non-specific back pain. The most common example of specific back pain is radiculopathy. So just to be clear on definition, so our language around this when we're describing this to patients and also other healthcare practitioners is very important. So localised displacement of disc material beyond the normal margins of the intervertebral disc, but it, that alone isn't enough. It has to result in pain, weakness or numbness in the distribution of a myotome or dermatome. Now importantly, most patients will improve independent of treatment. So people presenting with radiculopathy, perhaps regardless of what we do, the long-term prognosis for these patients is actually positive. So clinically, and it's important to differentiate between radiculopathy and radicular pain. So patients may say, I've got sciatic or they've got pain down the back of their leg and a simple clinical straight leg raise test of that reproducing the pain down the patient's leg does not give us a diagnosis of radiculopathy. There needs to be pain as well as weakness and or numbness in those distributions and it may present with or without low back pain. And you'll see a dermatomal charts here. Um, there is wide variation between different dermatomal charts but this research is somewhat helpful in terms of distribution of symptoms. If someone's got an L4 radiculopathy, 88% chance of medial shin location of symptoms, particularly sensory change. Okay, if they've got L5 radiculopathy, medial side of the foot closer to the big toe, 80% likelihood in that, and patients with S1 radiculopathy, more the lateral border of the foot. So they're good simple clinical cues in terms of location of the symptoms. So if someone's presenting with leg symptoms plus or minus back pain, and they're describing pain, weakness or numbness, they're the three most common locations of symptoms, particularly of altered sensation, that can be a good clinical cue. Now coming on to clinical examination in terms of radiculopathy, those components of lower limb reflexes, muscle power and sensation are important to assess. There's greater reliability for the power and reflex assessment than there is for sensory assessment alone. The straight leg raise in addition to that, as well as assessment of spinal mobility can be helpful. So symptom reproduction in terms of spinal mobility may be with forward bending towards the toes or also backwards bending. Both of those, depending on the presentation, may reproduce the patient's leg symptoms. But each of these individual tests has poor reliability alone. So combining those findings is particularly important. So if I was in the clinical setting and a patient presented with leg symptoms and talking about altered muscle power or sensation, then we'd be potentially looking at, all right, what do we need to assess? I'd assess their range of motion and looking if that's reproducing into flexion or extension. The straight leg raise test would guide me again, so not just lifting the leg, but adding dorsiflexion to sensitize the neural structures in the leg. Then I'd be doing my reflex power and sensory assessment. 
and particularly if reflex and power are diminished with a particular myotome, such as your knee jerk or your ankle jerk, along with those other findings, then we've got a stronger chance of diagnosing radiculopathy. Now, as a practical tip, radiculopathy alone isn't a red flag or cause for alarm. It's more if there's progressive neurological compromise. So if the patient's presenting and describing these symptoms are significantly progressing, then that's greater cause for concern. So that might be increasing in the loss of power or loss of sensation, and particularly frank numbness is important there. Obviously, urinary symptoms in terms of retention or overflow. But if they don't have those, but they have radiculopathy, again, following the guidelines, reassuring the patient. But if they have a mild loss of power, such as with a calf raise test, I might give them a strength test to monitor to say, well, today you can still do three calf raises on your affected leg. We're not concerned about that at the moment. We're going to follow these guidelines. But what we'll get you to do is once a day, just monitor that calf raise strength. And if that deteriorates where suddenly you can no longer do a calf raise, then perhaps there's evidence that your symptoms are progressing and we might need to either review you quickly or you may need to go to the emergency department. So informing them and giving them control over their situation without alarming them is probably the most effective combination of management there. So natural course is favourable, as we've mentioned. Here's the guidelines down the side, as we've addressed before. Evidence around epidural steroids. Routine use isn't supported. There is evidence that there's short-term benefit in pain of func and function, and this isn't sustained in some studies. So there's strong argument, though, if you implement first-line care and patients aren't improving, and then even with stronger analgesic, they're not improving and they're highly distressed by their pain, there is a clinical argument for the use of epidural steroids to give symptomatic relief for those patients. But again, we can inform them Odds are positive that you're going to get better over time anyway. This might give you some short-term symptomatic relief if you're really struggling to cope. Surgical management, short-term benefits compared to conservative management in that patient symptoms often improve faster, but studies over one, two, and five years suggest people that have surgical or conservative management, the outcomes are really no different. Is there a point to consider which we'll come back to shortly what contributes to the development and maintenance of people with radiculopathy. So there are factors beyond just the actual potential compression or irritation of the nerve root following a disc bulge, for example. So the acute non-specific back pain guidelines and radiculopathy guidelines we've talked through there. Keep in mind more than 85% of the patients that we see in primary care are actually in this acute non-specific category. The problem is if we look at um, this research that was published in 2013 on the recovery of non-specific back pain, if you look at, where are we there, 12, six weeks following onset of symptoms, 80% of people still have pain. At three months, 60% of people still have pain. And really, from that three-month period, this is six months and 12 months, the improvement really isn't a whole lot more. So at 12 months, 29% of people have no pain. So 70% of people still have some symptoms that may not be particularly disabling. Okay, Sorry, 29% have no symptoms. 43% have minimal pain. So over half the patients still have potentially moderate pain associated with their back pain episode. So recurrence and persistence of back pain is an important consideration. And it's particularly the persistent back pain that's associated with the higher levels of disability and associated impacts with that. So guidelines for persistent pain, first line care, pretty similar to acute back pain around simple analgesics and advice, physical therapies in terms of exercise and physiotherapy and other approaches are recommended. Poor response, again, stronger analgesics and then interdisciplinary rehabilitation, and arguably only in a small proportion of circumstances would surgery be considered. Keep in mind, this is an important definition of chronic pain, so pain that extends beyond the expected period of tissue healing. So we often say chronic pain is three months, but we may have patients with underlying health conditions such as diabetes, for example, that might affect rate of healing. 
So in those patients we may, might reasonably expect that their initial symptom aggravation or their tissue injury or inflammation may take longer to settle. So our guidelines for them becoming chronic is have those natural healing processes which may be delayed in those people, have they occurred once it's beyond that time, arguably chronic or persistent pain can be um, an appropriate label to use. So pharmacology, I'm not going to go into lots of detail at the moment, just importantly around strong opioids are not more effective than effectively paracetamol or anti-inflammatories and the issues with strong opioids are the side effects addiction risk, potentially opioid induced hyperalgesia with prolonged use and obviously um, more severe consequences than that. So I've given a handout and there's also a resource here which talks about the different options for pharmacology for managing back pain but also pain in general and in that describes the numbers needed to treat which basically talks about how many patients need to take that medication for them to have an effect um, and there's also potential side effects associated with that so that resource is quite a helpful guide when you're either deciding what to advise patients are also helping inform patients so that they understand the decision around the pharmacology. Now a quick review of exercise management for non-specific back pain. If you were to ask yourself or your family members what's the best management for low back pain, I'm sure you'll get quite a varied response. If you ask 10 people you may get five different responses and that has to tell us that there's a number of things that work for some people but not everything works for all people and the guidelines or the evidence around this clearly shows that. So from a Cochrane review in terms of Pilates which is popular, some evidence for its effectiveness but it's not superior to other forms of exercise. So decisions around that are based around really patients or care providers preferences and also costs might be important considerations. Core stability, strong evidence that core stability exercises are no more effective than other forms of active exercise. Walking, low quality evidence that walking is as effective as other non-pharmacological exercise managements for non-specific back pain. So some other examples, passive treatment for non-specific chronic back pain, very little confidence to support massage in the long term, therapeutic ultrasound, no high quality evidence to support the use of ultrasound, Spinal manipulation, so for chronic non-specific back pain, no evidence that it's more superior to anything else. Muscle energy techniques, which is a type of manual therapy approach with muscle contraction and effectively the evidence around this is poor. So again, again, exercise is good but we don't really know or we can't say as a panacea everyone needs to perform the same type of exercise for example. Multidisciplinary management for non-specific back pain, more effective than usual care and physical treatments but only low quality evidence. But interestingly for work outcomes, multidis rehab seems to be more effective than physical treatment but not more effective than usual care. So again, when we look across a group of individuals with non-specific back pain, we can't advise or recommend one specific or one approach that fits all. Quick comment on surgery and I think this is a powerful piece of information. Really there's limited advice we can offer the patients because the investigations into surgery for back pain have really looked at surgical technique rather than selection of patients for surgery. So as a result clinicians have very little evidence to guide their patients on. This is changing though a little. This interesting piece of information looking at spinal stenosis surgery for back pain recently published. So a reasonably large number of patients and a sensitivity questionnaire. So questioning patients about pain sensitivity. So having a high score on this pain sensitivity questionnaire was predictive of less improvement in both pain and disability one year after surgery. So this is potentially more useful research of predicting which patients may or may not have a positive outcome following surgery. So the number of questionnaires out there, this one interestingly has quite simple questions. So imagine your muscles are slightly sore as a result of physical activity is an example and patients rate how severe their pain response would be for that. So things that we'd expect a minor pain sensitivity response to if people are reporting their experience is of severe pain experience with those 
minor stimuli that suggest they've got increased pain sensitivity and that's the, the basis of or the utility of this questionnaire. So flagging those people that are more broadly sensitised to pain. So why aren't we being that effective? A, it's a complex problem and B, we've got guidelines and as mentioned earlier, these aren't necessarily being followed effectively. Keeping in mind that concept and this definition is old but it still applies today that pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So based on that, we may have tissue injury or trauma, but the emotional response and the context around that impacts on everyone's pain experience. Now the previous webinar that was conducted by Helen Slater um, covers a lot of this information around persistent musculoskeletal pain that I won't go into today, but that's a very useful resource in, resource in understanding different concepts and current concepts around pain and pain management, so I could highly recommend that. Everyone's familiar with the term biopsychosocial. One of our experiences though is people tend to either sit in the bio camp if you like or the psychosocial camp and there tends to be this lack of understanding of this is really a continuum. So people will present with pain from biological factors such as tissue injury, a disease process or actually increased tissue sensitivity. So there's increasing research around this tissue sensitivity concept now. So people with back pain, as we said, often may have an injury, but also may often not. So more than 50% of patients that present have back pain, but haven't actually had an injury to their tissues. So then our original or, or traditional thinking around telling this patient, you've actually injured your back and it needs time to settle. If someone hasn't had an injury, then something else has triggered this pain response and it's not actually necessarily local damage to tissues. Identifying whether there's an injury or, for example, a disease or inflammatory process is very important because pharmacological management might be guided by that, for example, but they won't be the only factors. Now, the psycho component is twofold in terms of broad categories. One's the emotional one, which commonly is thought of, but two is the cognitive, which is the thoughts and beliefs component. And as I've mentioned before, the beliefs and particularly fear avoidance as well are strongly predictive of poor outcomes so they're very important to consider. And these social aspects, aspects which are also easily to, easy to brush over, they can be very important contributors to ongoing pain. So it's contribution of each of these factors into someone's presentation which helps guide our management and that's really in simple terms the reason why there's no sim simple or single management for non-specific back pain because for each individual, a different cluster of factors will be, sorry, will be driving their problem. So we need to identify those for that person, then we can help develop targeted management. And we view these factors effectively like a volume knob, and that's what we explain to our patients. Look, sleep or stress may not have caused your pain, but if they, those are factors that are ongoing in your symptoms, they're effectively like an amplifier for your pain. So therefore, to help you get, a, get you back on track, addressing some attention to those factors as well may be an important component of helping settle your symptoms. Simple concept as I talked about with injury, you can have two workers with exactly the same injury but completely different outcomes and one could head down a terrible trajectory, the other one may recover and be back at work quickly. So if they've had the same injury, so same tissue effect um, on their back, why are these people functioning and recovering so differently? And that's that cluster of other factors that we've talked about. This important study looked at almost a thousand people with acute or recent onset back pain and monitored them over 12 months. And at 12 months, delayed recovery was associated with these factors. So it was nothing to do with the size of the injury, the size of the disc bulge, for example. It was these broader biopsychosocial factors that were contributing to their presentation. So when there's multiple of these present, your risk of chronicity goes up. So viewed this way, your chances of not recovering as you increase your number of flags associated with it is exponential. So what do I do? Simple summary, be informed, align your beliefs with current evidence as we've talked about, screen for risk early, which I'm about to cover, follow the guidelines that are there, they're actually pretty simple but they're fairly effective. If they're not working, that's when we need to go on to the next step of refer on early. So engage with people, so a local network of people that are evidence-informed healthcare practitioners that can 
provide the right advice early. Because as we all know, once these head to that persistent complex situation, they're much harder to deal with. So the key really is identifying these ones early and applying targeted management. So that's why screening tools are really worthwhile and you really need to be implementing this in the first two to six weeks. It doesn't give us a diagnosis. We need to add clinical examination and a reasoning process. And it doesn't inform us exactly what to do. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So one typical screening tool is a short form Ourobro questionnaire devised by um, Stephen Linton's group. So effectively, it estimates the risk of future work disability and it's scored out of 100. If you're more than 50 out of 100, you're at higher risk. We can also look at individual items on that questionnaire. So someone may be score, say, 70 out of 100, for example. But we can look at individual items to give us information about are there beliefs or are there psychological distress, perhaps major contributors to that. And there's a textbook around this as well that is a very useful resource for clinicians. Here's the questionnaire, the starting point. It's quite simple, so it talks about how long have you had your pain, how severe is it, your capacity in terms of work and sleep, how tense or anxious, how depressed you are, what your belief is, whether it will become persistent, do you think you'll be working, and then also around how fearful they are about pain or flaring up their pain. So that's one useful one. The other one around back pain is called the Start Back Questionnaire. So this is um, by um, Hill et al, and this was published in Lancet, where they did a large randomised trial using this questionnaire. Now importantly, it identified people as low, medium or high risk. And effectively, when you compared providing intervention based on this questionnaire, so if people were low risk, they got minimal intervention. If people were medium or high risk, they got more intervention. So importantly, these people had a slightly better outcome than the control group that weren't screened and stratified, but they needed less treatment and they had less time off work. So there's a cost saving based in that. In terms of the, the high risk and the medium risk, the intervention groups did somewhat better, but they actually put more resources into managing those patients. So key points from this are we can screen for risk and we can identify the people that who need greater resources early, but it doesn't tell us what resources they are, so exactly what treatment they need. This is the start back questionnaire, so it's a very short questionnaire. And these bottom components here are really the psychosocial risk. So when you're looking at the scoring of it, if people are scoring high in these psychosocial risk questions, they quickly become a medium or a high risk patient. So both of these screening tools are quite accurate at predicting risk. So what we can screen for in terms of psychological distress, I've just listed some examples of questionnaires here. So the DAS scale for fear avoidance, the FABQ or the TSK, and also for self-efficacy, so pain self-efficacy. And I'll talk about use of those briefly, but the resource from WorkCover Victoria has all these tools listed in there. So that's an online website that also talks about the scoring as well. So that's a useful resource for you. A framework that we teach off here at Curtin University around screening these patients for risk is this. So a self-administered questionnaire. If they're not high risk, provide reassurance and continue on with usual management. If they are high risk, we might use cognitive screening questionnaires. So around fear, for example. And then there's some guidelines here of management, either addressing the patient's beliefs and then also pain management and functional restoration directed around those beliefs. If they're not high with cognitive factors, but they're high on distress, so anxiety, stress, depression, then they may, may need psychological, pharmacological, as well as graded physical activity and lifestyle intervention. Whereas if there's more social factors going on, then we may need to look at addressing workplace factors, other social or family services. So not just going, okay, yellow flags are higher, let's break it down into these different components and potentially target the management more directed at those components. So in the clinic, screening questionnaires are really important. Getting the patient's story, was there an actual injury or not? Or was it more an insidious onset? Body chart is very helpful. Widespread pain compared to localised pain 
gives us that indication that their pain behaviour may also be more non-mechanical. So for a small stimulus, they get a large flare-up. That's not a typical pain response to mechanical pain presentations. So arguably, they should be getting more input, more targeted management or on referral quicker. And observing generally the patient's behaviours. If someone's particularly demonstrative about their pain, clearly distressed about their pain, those alone are good clinical cues. So as I showed this picture earlier, we teach off this clinical translation framework which aids people just in thinking about the flag, thinking about is it acute or persistent, what pain's going on, are there psychosocial factors and just quickly checking through each of those to rate a priority list of what's driving or contributing to the patient's presentation, therefore where do we need to direct the resources. So simply breaking that down again, red flag disorder present, yes, refer on. Are there signs of a specific disorder that may require investigation to get a diagnosis that may be relevant? But is that the only thing contributing to their problem? So they may need management around their radiculopathy, but they all may, may also be highly distressed or have unhelpful beliefs. So there may be radiculopathy management plus factors addressing their beliefs and understanding of their problem. Or if it's non-specific pain, then what are the strong driving components of that based on our screening questionnaires and our clinical assessment and then targeting management with our healthcare team around the appropriate priorities for that. Now from a work perspective, TAC and WorkSafe Victoria have developed this clinical framework for the delivery of health services. I've included that as a resource because this is also a fantastic resource. There's a um, a short video on this, a five minute video, which is very worth viewing around implementing these concepts. Basically simple things, measure and demonstrate effectiveness of treatment, a biopsychosocial approach, empower the injured person, implement goals directed at function, participation and return to work, and base your management on available evidence. So these are examples of screening tools and different things that we might measure when we're monitoring the progress of patients. And again, that WorkSafe Victoria website has all these resources available for you if you want to access them in an online electronic format. So those principles of empowering the injured person, optimising function and using evidence, as I say, those tools are relevant. The Pain Health website that I mentioned previously is also a fantastic resource because there is those general health screening tools on that. There's videos or stories for patients so they can realise they're not the only ones in those situations, particularly with more complex persistent pain problems. There's information about different treatment or management options. There's also different information around pharmacology so people can be informed and empowered. And this website's just undergoing another update so it really provides current best practice um, information available both to clinicians and also patients. So finally, the most important perspective, these are some simple questions that I highly recommend you asking your client or patient when they attend the clinic. So why have you come to see me today? We can head down a path of trying to find their pathology, sort out their problem, but their issues may be quite simpler to um, deal with in that they just want some reassurance, for example, rather than want to be fixed. So why have you come to see me? What do you think is going on? So understanding their perspective and their beliefs. What do you think you need? So as I say, it can be a whole lot simpler than we um, work it out to be by trying to go into a complex path. What do you hope to get out of this session? And again, expectations matching that is strongly linked to satisfaction and patient outcome. That's it from me as a bit of a rapid overview. Obviously happy to take questions now or expand on any of that information that I've covered. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Tim. That was an incredibly comprehensive presentation and as you said yourself, hopefully that goes some way to um, positively influencing beliefs and also practice management behaviour uh, for the people watching today. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in already and uh, I encourage anyone to, who wants to ask a question to um, type it into the chat box now. Also, if we don't um, manage to answer all the questions before we finish at 1.30, um, Tim has kindly offered to answer any uh, questions offline and those responses can be provided to you with the recording of the webinar. So Tim, one of the first questions that came through earlier on when you were talking about the sort of the administration of the 
or the administering of one gram of paracetamol four times a day. There was a query about whether that was far higher than the dose often recommended on a um, medication pack. Do patients fear these high doses and, um, and, and how long would you expect that someone would stay on a dose at that level? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, that's clearly what the guidelines state around the, the recommended dosage. And I think clear information from the person prescribing that is, is really important. So obviously that's ideally a, a medical practitioner. For example, if a physiotherapist is involved, then I would recommend the um, patient also speak to a pharmacist, for example, around that to be getting appropriate information. The review guidelines talk about one to two weeks. Um, often patients, in my experience, um, do well with taking that only for a few days, but we need to set a review time, importantly, with the patient. So you could do it two ways, say, let's get you to stick on that for the course of the week and review you in a week's time to monitor how that's going, or if you're concerned, trial it for a few days, and if you're not getting effect from that, then offer the, the patient the opportunity to either contact or come back in for a review to monitor how or why that's not progressing. Okay, thanks Tim. And another question, you talked about the uh, sometimes the pain experience can actually sort of uh, seem to extend for a longer time than what you would expect for the sort of the healing of any, any tissue damage. Um, how are practitioners uh, to know the average tissue healing time um, and in, would, would three months be a sort of a, a reasonable sort of time frame to expect any um, t tissue damage to have uh, uh, been been fixed? Yeah, look, in short, three months is quite a reasonable time frame. In lots of soft tissue injuries, six weeks is actually quite a reasonable time frame. So as a general guide, that's probably why the term three months has been developed, that time frame, because in almost all situations, you talk about bone healing, for example, as well, that time frame is very reasonable. Um, it's just particularly if someone's got nerve related pain, for example, if someone's got diabetes or a diabetic neuropathy, then healing times would be extended beyond that. So we could take the six to 12 weeks as a, a guideline for a time frame, if you like, but some patients, our expectations would shift to beyond that time frame if they've got other health conditions as mentioned. Having said that, even if someone does have a tissue injury, and I, I see this very commonly. So someone may have a spinal fracture, for example, or have had significant trauma to their back. Often those people go on to develop persistent pain disorders, not necessarily because of the injury, but other factors such as their beliefs or their distress around their pain. So in that circumstance, as we've mentioned, using the screening tools such as the short form Orobro or other distress questionnaires early on can help guide us and say, okay, this person does have tissue injury, but they're scoring very highly in terms of their psychological distress or unhelpful beliefs or fear avoidance regarding their pain. So we might need to consider addressing those components early on, not waiting till three months or longer and saying, oh, this patient's not getting better, maybe we need to look at other options. It's very easy to implement those screening tools early on. If the score is low, we can say, all right, put, it, put that aside and not worry about that for now. We might recheck that at six or 12 weeks time if they're not recovering. But if the score is high and it's only two weeks in, there's still good evidence around providing additional input or resources into those patients early on, even if they do have a tissue injury. And Tim, another question. How do you manage the patient that has actually been and had the imaging um, but is still sort of focused on the sort of the idea of a bulging, bulging disc um, or some other, some other pathology that's causing the pain? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's two parts to that answer. The first one is asking the patient what they understand or what they believe and then we can provide them with evidence around do you know what the facts state, such as by the time you get to 40 years of age, over 50% of people are likely to have some sort of findings of a disc bulge on their scan. And there's a number of studies that have, been, that have shown that the level of the bulge or the degree of degeneration on the scan doesn't correlate with the amount of symptoms. So citing evidence and being conversant in simple language with the patient to say that that the scans alone don't predict your outcome is very important. But 
the other aspect of that is what the patient's belief is. So that's why we need to ask them what they understand what is wrong. Because if someone has a very strongly held belief, if they say, for example, I know my disc's stuffed or I'm not going to get better until I have an operation, telling someone the direct opposite of that is actually unlikely to be helpful. So we need to give them that information gently and explore with them perhaps over time how that we can perhaps get them to increase their function or activity levels without them getting sore to slowly shift that belief. The other powerful thing that I use is engaging more than one healthcare practitioner because if people have persistent pain or they've seen multiple people, they've often had multiple different messages. So if you have a team of people that you work with that are well aligned with the evidence, having two or three people provide the same message is often a, a more powerful way of shifting someone's beliefs in that regard. And um, just one more uh, question of interest. Um, you know, we've heard for the last few years that imaging is not recommended by the, the guidelines. Do we know that if, if practice is actually changing, is there any sort of um, examination of the data to show that um, uh, unnecessary imaging um, is, is, on, is on the wane? The short answer is it's only changing very slowly, which is problematic and it, I think it really does come down to the beliefs and as I mentioned on um, one of those papers there, beliefs from the healthcare practitioners about chasing pathology when pathology has repeatedly been shown not to be helpful in terms of guiding our management, but also the expectation of the patient coming to the healthcare practitioner and expecting to get um, radiology as an answer to their information. And it is, it's a lot harder for us to say to the patient, look, we're not concerned about this, we don't need to get a scan at this stage when the person sitting in front of you does have significant back pain. I think a powerful way for clinicians to change that is to listen to the patient, so ask them their perspective and conduct a skewed clinical examination. So we can quite clearly say, look, the guidelines tell us that if you haven't got clear signs of a fracture and I've done my clinical examination, I've tested your power and your reflexes and I've looked at your movement and I've determined those findings are that you don't have clear signs of nerve compression, there's no need to get a scan. So if we can show the, the patient that we've done a skilled thorough examination and appropriate language, then in my experience the patients are fine with that. It's when they're in agony and they're just sitting there asking for a scan and we're saying don't worry about it, that that's not enough to satisfy their concerns. And, and one last question, Tim, um, you mentioned earlier about um, sort of uh, suggesting to uh, patients that they avoid listening to, to their pain. So, um, so how could, could you please elaborate um, on, on what you exactly mean by that? Yeah, of course there's a balance there in terms of we don't want people completely um, ignoring their pain and pushing through pain and significantly flaring their symptoms up. The, the key information around that is that it's okay to have some pain with movement and our body actually recovers and heals by being gently mobile and active rather than immobile. So we want to have you up and moving around. So if someone has acute back pain, we'd be saying, look, every hour we need you to go up and walk around for five minutes if you're in really acute back pain because that mobility, circulation and changing position is an important component of management. Now, it's a broad comment of don't listen to your pain or don't be guided purely by your pain. You have some individuals that tend to push too hard and you need to say the, the, the message differently to them and for that person say you actually need to back off. Whereas you have other individuals and again if you use those screening questionnaires, we use the short form Orobro with every patient that comes through the door. If they're scoring high and they look like they're a fearful patient, they're the ones that I'll reassure more and use that message, don't use pain as your guide, use these cues as a guide. So it's about clear information but tailored to the individual in front of you. Okay Tim, we've reached the end of our questions, we've each reached the end of our time. So look, I'd like to thank you sincerely once again. That was a really fantastic uh, presentation, just um, incorporating the research evidence into very sort of practical strategies for health professionals to use. So thanks. 
very much, Tim. Um, and if I could ask all participants, once uh, um, I say goodbye, uh, the exit survey will actually come up on your screens and it's really helpful um, to us if you could just take a, a very brief moment to complete that exit survey. So thanks everyone once again for joining us today and thanks very much to Tim and goodbye everyone. <laughs>